Uh, hey, uh, my name is Matt. I play guitar and, and do the yelling for uh, <laughs> Exhumed and Gruesome. And uh, <clears throat> Relapse has uh, asked me to come on and uh, talk about a couple of the, of the tunes that they're going to play uh, from my bands, which was quite nice of them. Um, and uh, first, I guess, we'll talk about uh, Funeral Fuck, which is an old Exhumed song, uh, a song that I don't think we played live in, you know, 12, 13 years at this point. Um, the cool thing about this tune was that uh, when we were doing Slaughter Cult, our, our second record, uh, our guitar player, Mike Beams, our other guitar player, Mike Beams, started coming in, uh, coming in and contributing material, which he wasn't able to do uh, when we did the first album because everything was written by the time he joined the band. And Funeral Fuck was one of his songs. And I remember Mike's one of those guys who's a brilliant musician, but he's kind of a space cadet, you know, like an Ace Frehley kind of guy. <laughs> and never really bothers to learn like the lyrics or the names of any songs. And <clears throat> we were talking about you know, how Mayhem was one of the few black metal bands that we liked. And uh, he's like, yeah, I really like that song, Funeral Fuck. And I was like, dude, it's Funeral Fog. He's like, really? Oh, I thought it was Funeral Fuck. And so when he brought the song to us at practice, we just started calling it Funeral Fuck. And the name stuck. And ironically, the first tour that we did for that record for Slaughter Cold was supporting Mayhem. Uh, so I think we, we made sure to play that one every night. Um, but it's got really cool riffs because Mike thinks in the ways that I don't that are kind of bizarre and, and really interesting. And, um, you know, it still ends up sounding like a zoom because Cole and I are playing the songs, but Mike has a, a really a cool kind of atonal riffing style that I always liked. And I always wish that he would have written more songs when he was in the band. But, uh, so yeah, that's, that's funeral fuck. <laughs> You are my final regard 
I also play in a band called Gruesome, which is a uh, an homage, I guess you call it, to uh, to death uh, a band that I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with. And um, Dimensions of Horror is the title track from our second record. Um, our first record was kind of more focused on paying tribute to leprosy, and the second one, uh, Dimensions of the Horror, is kind of more focused on screen bloody gore, um, which has always actually been my favorite death album. Um, when I was a little kid, I remember in my mom's living room, uh, we used to play. We didn't have a drummer yet, but it was just like me and two buddies with the guitars and stuff. And we used to play Regurgitated Guts and Sacrificial and Infernal Death and, you know, it's a few few other songs like, you know, Riot of Violence by Creator and stuff like that. When, I mean, this is back in like 1988, 89, I guess I must have been about, you know, 12 or 13 years old. So Death has always been a band that's been very close to my heart. And um, it's just a lot of fun to try to write more Death songs and try to, you know, do justice to Chuck's style and, and what he and, and the guys did back then, you know. Um, but Dimensions of Horror... Um, it was it, it just one of those songs that kind of was the last song we wrote for the record. And I think by the time, you know, writing the first song for a record is always kind of hard. But then by the time you get about three or four under your belt, like you have a lot of momentum. And I think I was feeling really kind of in the zone or whatever you want to call it. When we wrote Dimensions of Horror. And I was like, I could just kind of tell, I was like, I think this is a pretty good one. I think we did okay here. And, um, you know, it quickly was decided that that would be the title track and that would be the single. And, and it, the, the coolest thing about it is that I finally got to make a music video that I liked. Like, Exhumed had done a couple of things that I was kind of lukewarm on. And the, the, the Dimensions of Horror music video that we filmed in Miami was was really fantastic. Um, Mitch from our label, Mix and Maruta, helped direct it and, um, you know, kind of put the, the shoot together and, we worked together on, you know, uh, the the concept of the video, and it's, you know, basically about opening a portal into the realm of Cthulhu and the other Lovecraftian ancient ones and such. <laughs> so it's very much steeped in that sort of 80s, you know, Evil Dead kind of horror. And with the budget that we had in 2016, the special effects are very 80s, which is completely appropriate. You know, to me, uh, a lot of my favorite horror movies and stuff were always... The, the B type movies that were a little bit grimier and uh, a little bit more kind of homemade, and, that, and I felt like Death Metal was kind of aesthetically uh, right in that same wheelhouse, you know. Whereas, you know, by the time I was a kid in the late '80s, Thrash Metal was already very professional, and you know, everybody was on a major label, and it was quite polished in a lot of ways. But Death Metal was still very raw and very. Um, very DIY, you know, even the bands that had record deals, you know, still were very underfunded and, and very raw. Um, and I, I love that quality about that whole era of death metal. And, and it just seemed to me like when I first heard Scream Buddy Gore, I was like, oh, this is like the musical version of all these movies that I was watching, you know, because um, before I was into death metal or even metal in general, I was already into horror movies. And, you know, I, I, but I also always enjoyed the stuff that had a little bit of a sense of humor to it. Like my favorites were Evil Dead 2 and Reanimator and, you know, even like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, where you, it's really violent and, and really gory, but it also is having fun while doing it. And it kind of acknowledges that it's, it's, it's so brutal that it's, it's almost becomes cartoonish and it's okay to, to get a laugh at the same time, you know? Um, I, obviously I love stuff like, the Fulci stuff with the Beyond and, and uh, Gates of Hell and stuff. And we have gruesome songs about those movies that are a little bit more atmospheric and dark and, and serious, you know. But I think um, just for me as a person, maybe it's because I'm from, like, the California suburbs and grew up around, like, skaters and, like, punk rockers or whatever. It's hard for me to take it so seriously all the time and feel like I'm this, like, dark, evil person because I'm not a pretty cheerful guy. So I like movies that, uh, you know, have a little bit of that goofy sense of humor. And I think that I tend to write death metal that kind of has that same vibe, like violent and gory, but also, you know, it's fun. Like we're having fun, you know, um, it's rock and roll. So there you go.
On the afternoon of August 18th, 1973, five young people in a Volkswagen van ran out of gas on a farm road in South Texas. Four of them were never seen again. The next morning, the one survivor, Sally Hardesty Enright, was picked up on a roadside, blood caked and screaming murder. Sally said she had broken out of a window in hell. The girl babbled a mad tale. A cannibal family in an isolated farmhouse, chainsawed fingers and bones, her brother, her friends, hacked up for barbecue, chairs made of human skeletons, then she sank into catatonia. Texas lawmen mounted a month-long manhunt but could not locate the macabre farmhouse. They could find no killers and no victims, no facts, no crime. Officially, on the records, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre never happened. But during the last 13 years, over and over again, reports of bizarre, grisly chainsaw mass murders have persisted all across the state of Texas. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre has not stopped. It haunts Texas. It seems to have no end.
Steve here on the Relapse Podcast for the special October Halloween edition. I'm joined today by Chase, the lead vocalist of none other than Gay Creeper. And thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast with me, man. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. And just to kick things off right away, Gay Creeper, you've only been a band for a few years now, and you've putting out your debut record on Relapse Records. you got to tell me the backstory the backstory about how you were able to get this record deal? Oh, well, um, when we first put out our first EP, um, it was just a couple of us. It wasn't even a full band. We recorded it, put it up online before we had ever played a show. Um, soon after that, you know, it got some attention. Um, some people started to write about it on blogs and kind of spread from there and um, started playing started playing shows and started touring. Um, we did a couple splits and, um, on our East coast tour, um, we met up with Dom who runs eight, three, eight, nine. Um, he expressed interest that he wanted to put out a record. Um, and so we were kind of going with that. And then, um, on one of those same shows, um, some of the people there from relapse came to, the show at Kung Fu Necktie in Philly. Um, but I, they didn't really say anything to us. They just kind of watched us and bought our record that we had available and um, I guess enjoyed our, our set. Um, fast forward to when we were ready to record our full length and um, we finished it. And, uh, and then Dom was kind of slowing down his label. He said, you know, this is really, really good. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it to Relapse and see what they think. And they had already heard us. They already knew what we were capable of uh, playing live. So hit it off. And Just, it was, as soon as they were interested, we were obviously uh, interested as well. So we're happy to have our first full length on Relapse. I can't really think of any better scenario for us as a band. Uh, well, the Sonoran Desert is uh, the area of desert um, that covers a lot of uh, Arizona, where we're from. So um, we're spread out over uh, Phoenix and Tucson in Arizona, which are about two hours apart, but both uh, fall in the Sonoran Desert. It's hot. It's dry. Um, and, you know, we're a little bit fucked up, you know, because we have the just over 110 degree weather in the summers and i think our, our minds are melted a little bit so um that we wanted a title that um kind of displays that and just being depraved and just fucked up from being in the desert and making just disgusting music last year when you were talking about that east coast tour i was able to catch you at pretty fucking wild basement show in new brunswick random ass new jersey and i forget oh. who, i forget who in the band i was talking to after the show but we started talking about you guys being from arizona the whole arizona music scene so how does gate creeper really enhance what is around you besides for uh, the whole desert fucking up shit <laughs> um i i don't know i think it's you know you hear about you know black metal bands and stuff like that from scandinavia where it's it's just miserable and, uh, you know, snowing outside and you have nothing to do but to just be inside and play the guitar and just do whatever it is that you're obsessed with. And I feel like that's a little bit of the same for us but on the on the opposite side where there's there's nothing to really do um, except for to make music. There hasn't been... Um, another, another reason why we wanted to kind of rip, rip where we're from the album title is because Arizona is not a place that's really known for much music at all, and especially not death metal. We've had some, some great bands now and in the past, but we wanted to kind of put it out there since we were going to be able to have a a wider audience for this record, and we wanted to put us on put our uh, our region on the map. Yeah, in recent years, I mean not even recent, pretty much a lot of people know of Job for a Cowboy coming for the area, so really, 
it's the first in a long time that a great death metal band is coming to rep the Arizona scene. Yeah. Speaking of the whole death metal scene, if you want to call it that way, what do you think about Gay Creeper set yourself apart from everybody else? Um, I think that um, we try to make things simple and um, and memorable. You know, we don't really try to make things, you know, fancy and technical and... Um, we just try to dumb it down and make it and and play what we want to hear. And I think that in a lot of death metal um, and a lot of bands that are, you know, kind of doing the Swedish death metal thing, it, it gets lost. I mean, they have that, you know, the HM2, the Chainsaw Tone, but they don't really have riffs that you'll remember. Um, and I think that that's, that's one thing that we've always focused on is writing good songs and songs that... Uh, you know, you want to listen to over and over and songs that get caught in your head. And now as we speak currently, you're on tour with Skeleton Witch, Oathbreaker, and Iron Reagan. This has to be probably the biggest lineup you guys have been on nationally, right? Yeah, this is our first, uh, we've done some touring in the past, but this is like our first package tour that we've been on, and it's, it's been really cool so far. How has it been sharing the stages with those three bands? It's great, man. I mean, we're, we're playing first, um, as we should be, because all those bands are incredible um and everybody on on stage and off stage has just been it's been great to us um but it's 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 great to, it's a very mixed um lineup but it makes sense it does um, they're all extreme bands but they all kind of encompass a different aspect of it which i think makes it an amazing bill yeah it's been great this is uh we've played i guess we've done four shows on the tour so far Today's a, an off date, and we're playing our own um, our own headlining show. But I think it's Phil from Iron Reagan's birthday today, so I think all the other bands, even though they're not playing, they're going to come hang out. We're just going to have have fun for his birthday. Happy birthday shout out! Yeah. Now, while you're on tour, well, of course, there's a lot of driving around going on. Do you have a specific tour playlist you've been playing, or any cool bands you want to shout out? You've been getting you through the trip um on this tour we've been li doing this thing where we listen to bad albums so <laughs> um like we listen to you know like saint anger um <laughs> we listen to like celtic frost cold lake which i think is actually a good album but it's one of those like you know of the, all the celtic frost a, albums it's known as being a bad album yeah um what else do we listen to? Um, I don't know. It's 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 fun to play a game where we find to to find you know a really good band that just put out a really bad album, um, and then we just try to listen to the whole thing. Do you find this pumps you up for getting to the concerts? I think so. I, at least it entertains us. You know, it kind of distracts us from being in the band for for so long. Um, other stuff that we just listen to just to enjoy um listen to crowbar a lot um not heavier yeah listen to marauder master killer um i don't know just mix it up it's usually me and eric our guitar player that are up front and, and choosing the music designated um, djs yeah i think if eric gets tired he'll put on like something to pump him up like kind of like hate breed or something makes um, sense but he also likes a lot of country so sometimes we'll listen to some george Strait or something like that when we're just cruising on the highway for those open highway roads yeah makes sense and and yesterday or i guess it was two days ago when we were in tampa um you know like we just as soon as we got to florida we just started listening to like obituary you know like we try to if we're in a, if we're in an area we're going to an area where we know the band is from and we'll put that on and kind of get in the in the local mood how many shows are you playing in florida i believe a few correct yeah um we played in tampa we played in gainesville and tonight we're playing in pensacola so three and the way that the tour is laid out is that it's bringing you back to arizona yeah so we're actually going to be uh back at home 
two days after the record comes out. So we're going to be in Austin on the 7th when our record comes out. And then we'll be back at home at the night. So we're going to, I mean, it's still the same lineup for this, for the tour in the same order. Um, but we're going to kind of make that a, our record release show and hopefully sell the place out. Other than playing back in Arizona, what's your most anticipated or if you already had one stop or city from the tour? We're playing at the Roxy in LA. Um, never played there, but I've been to shows there. Um, cause me and my girlfriend will drive out from Phoenix where we live to LA. It's only like five or six hours. That's not bad. I thought uh, it would actually be more. No, it's not that far. So like we, we went to see recently like on glass and the dead beats play at the Roxy, um, seen electric wizard play there. Um, it's a really cool venue. So that as far as where I'm looking forward to playing most would be there. Um, and then just as far as where I, I'm excited to be would be, uh, up in the Pacific Northwest and like Portland and Seattle. Cause we all have a bunch of friends that live up there. Um, so that'll be fun too. That area is awesome just to begin with in general. Yeah. So you and I were talking the other day, Chase, about the gold vinyl that Closed Casket is putting out. Have you had a history with the label before, or is this a first-time kind of thing? Um, we haven't we haven't worked with them yet. Um, this is the first time. Um, but back about the time that I was telling you about previously with uh, Acer 8 9 and kind of who we were possibly going to work with for a full length, Justin and Closed Casket was uh, one of those people. Um, so when we decided that we were going to do the, the full length on relapse, he still wanted to be involved. Um, he's had some, some similar situations of bands that he'd put out and they moved on to bigger labels and he, he still had his, his hand in the next release. So, um, he just wants to put out good music. He wants to be involved with, with bands that he likes. So, um, we're really excited that he's, he was part of it and, uh, I haven't, actually held the records myself yet um but i've seen pictures of the gold records and it looks really cool do you have the gold oh so you don't have the gold record on tour with you no not yet we we, we have a we're getting the records the day before uh in a couple of days i guess uh on thursday before it comes out we're going to pick it up from a friend's house in texas and then we'll have them for the rest of the tour Nice. And speaking of one last touring bit, after this tour finishes up, do you guys have any plans coming back out the East Coast way or staying local? Um, um, not for the rest of the year. Um, when we get back, a couple of days when we get, after we get back, we have a there's a fest that we're playing, and then we got a couple local shows lined up. Um, we we're 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 working on getting some some uh, tours going for for next year. And we'd definitely want to come back out to the East Coast, but um, nothing set in stone yet. But I'm sure it will happen at some point, hopefully sooner than later. If you guys are looking to come out to New Jersey, hit me up because I want to make that happen. Yeah, we'll get some fat sandwiches or something. Oh fuck yeah, do those are the best. <laughs> <laughs> now, real quick, how much of your band's rising publicity do you owe to the man himself, Trevor from the Black Dahlia Murder? Oh man. I don't, I don't know, like, probably a lot. I mean, he's, there's been a couple people that have uh, just put us on from the beginning, and he's definitely one of them. Because um, I, I know that he's just a super, like, he's a metal nerd. Like, yeah, he is. Know, <laughs> like us, you know. He's always looking for new shit. Um, and very early on, he posted about us. Because I actually, um, his girlfriend... It grew up in Arizona, and I've known her since we were, we were super young. Oh. So I think that as soon as we were done and it got online, she kind of sent it his way or, or showed it to him in person. And um, and then we just, you know, we met, we've been friends. But he posted, he's posted about us since the very beginning. And um, on their last tour that they did, um, it was they were there playing Olive on Hollowed. Um, we got to play two of the shows. There was two shows in Arizona, so we got to play both of them. And he's he's been cool even up till you know the, the past week or two. He heard us about us and that column that he has, and we owe a lot to him. There's a, there's a couple people that um, have you know gave us a boost from very early on, and he's definitely one of them. Yeah, he is an awesome guy. <laughs> All right, so 
I wanted to play Dying Fetus Subjected to a Beating. Um, this one's for the car player Eric. This is his, this is his jam. Um, he actually has it as uh, an alarm clock on his phone. I heard it this morning. Um, so yeah, Dying Fetus Subjected to a Beating from Rain Supreme.
Next one is incantation, um, christening the afterbirth, um, from onward to Golgotha. It's one of my one of my favorite um, relapse tracks. Um, incantation, the incantation albums are some of the best. I think of old school death metal that relapse had a hand in. So, and this is one of my favorite tracks from that album. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, uh, Patriarchal Crip. Um, this is a song on the record that opens up the B-side. Um, I think it's one of, um, collectively, one of our favorite songs to play live. Um, we we wrote this song right before we did our last tour that we did in, in January. So we, we had a chance to, to play um, a fresh song for us every night and uh it's been one of my favorites ever since and i think it came out really great on the record and it's a really good uh centerpiece for it it kind of gives a, a a much needed break in the middle um and uh yeah patriarchal grip as one um, this one is a love song I, I hadn't done everything I'd never done anything like that before um, there's a song on Graves album Into the Grave 
that I really like called In Love. And uh, it's kind of the same same vibe to it. So I um, figured I'd, I'd try my hand at that. It's one of the songs on the record that um, is very influenced by, like, Dismember's Massive Killing Capacity and, and Tomb's Wolverine Blues. Um, and I think it's, it's a short, just... It just beats your ass from the beginning to the end. And uh, it's one of my favorites on the record. Awesome. I think that actually might be my favorite song on the record as well. Really? Yeah. Yeah, dude, I love the album. Like I was telling you before, dude, fucking awesome job. Thanks, man. I'm 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 stoked on it. I'm proud of it. I'm I'm glad it's coming out on relapse. There's everything about it is like everything that we could have hoped for, so it's it's still surreal to me, you know, it's until I hold those records in my hand, I don't think it'll even I it probably won't even feel real at that point, but it's pretty surreal. Yeah. And now, Chase, thank you so much for being on the podcast with me, man. Cool. Do you thank have you any... Of course. Do you have any final words you'd like to say? Um, no. Um, we're happy to to uh, have our first record out on Relapse, and uh, we hope that everybody likes the record, and hopefully that we can play all over the world in the coming year or two. And that's always the goal. Well, thank you so much, Chase. It's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Yeah, thank you.